There's times I wake up in the morning, I just like laugh that I live here. I've seen a bear every single day. The thing that makes a really unique and good wildlife photograph is we're here to help you get what you want out of the experience. ISO, shutter speed, how you want your settings. We definitely do bear viewing as well. Cool, there's bears everywhere. What am I gotten myself in time to move? But he's getting those shots of that bear walking at him. Our primary goal is to keep people safe while doing the activities they want to do on the river. Hey everybody, my name is Alex McGregor and this is the first of a video series we're going to be coming out about our recent trip up to Alaska. We were able to explore Anchorage and some glaciers and we made it down to Katmai National Park for some incredible bear viewing. This video is an interview I did with my friend John who's a fantastic wildlife photographer and he works at Brooks Lodge in Katmai as a bear viewing guide, a fishing guide in general hand around the lodge. If you're at all interested in fishing, wildlife photography, or potentially going up to Katmai National Park yourself, please watch this video. It's about 24 minutes long and I know you'll enjoy it. So John, uh, how long have you worked with Brooks? Uh, I got in on May 10th, so this is my first summer out here. So cool. we flew in on May 10th, first plane here besides NPS maintenance staff. So it was pretty cool getting in early in the season and being one of the few people here to start the season. Yeah, what, what uh, were you doing before this? I worked for a company in Michigan. Uh, we sold hand tools and I did a bunch of trade show travel and got me into photography, visiting a bunch of national parks, kind cool. of squeezed that into my work trips. And then I visited Alaska last September as part of like a photography workshop. Uh, one nice. of my hobbies is wildlife photography. So I uh, visited Lake Clark National Park and just was my first time to Alaska. And I thought, man, I really just got to get here somehow. So yeah. I applied a bunch of lodges and Jason here at Brooks Lodge called me back and was like, well, what are your hobbies? And it was like fishing and wildlife photography. He's like, I think we got something that could make it work. Yeah, we we got to do a bit of both of those things earlier. Too. Yeah, exactly. So you were primarily a photographer and looking to just get into the best situations possible yep. with the camera. Yep. And it seems like this is a great place to do it. I don't know if it's on camera, but there's a brown bear right behind us. Like coming up here, did you have like certain expectations? Like an, I want to get these, these photos or? Yeah, everyone like, it's pretty synonymous, Brooks Falls with the classic salmon, brown bear catching the salmon yep. shot, you know? Um, so I had expectations for that. I also kind of wanted to get some different stuff that not a lot of people got here because everyone's after the same shot when they visit Brooks, yeah. you know? So I kind of wanted to get a little variation and kind of be a little different. Obviously still want that shot, but when I thought about Brooks, I was like, I knew it was uh, expectation wise, one of the best brown bear viewing spots on earth. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I have pretty high expectations, but so far it's exceeded those. I mean, I've seen a bear every single day uh, since I got here on May 10th. so. There's times where if I'm starting work at 8 a.m., I roll out of bed and I get stuck behind a bear and I'm late. You know, we just call those bear jams around here. Sometimes bears keep you from getting places on time and you yeah. see somebody and they're like, hey, where were you? And I was like, ah, it's bear jammed up for a little bit. Uh, it sounds way better than any city. Definitely better than a traffic jam, yeah. yeah. What, what have you found has made the difference for like a good photo of a bear, but those special ones? Uh, so to me, the thing that makes a really unique and good wildlife photograph is being at eye level with uh, the animal. That's the one thing about the falls platform, you're a little above eye level, so it's really a unique experience. I like to go out there more and just look at bear behavior necessarily more than photograph. Yep. Um, so you see really, really cool interactions, but a lot of the time you're kind of like above them. It's still really, really cool. For me, a unique and really cool wildlife photograph I love to be as low as possible and on that same plane as the animal. It feels like you're just way more connected with that animal than if you were up at a different angle. I do love the platform, like you said, for the viewing experience. Mm -hmm. It's the coolest spot I've ever been in the presence of bears because you have that measure of safety. Yep. And yeah, watching the behavior, watching how they interact and there's like politics at the falls. 100%. And you're, they're like so used to that po uh, platform being like jam packed full of people that they just pretend like they, you might as well not exist. Yeah. So it's like a glimpse into real bear behavior, the hierarchy 
and you would like see all of these different types of interactions that you would struggle to see anywhere else. Yep, it's a beautiful spot. So thinking about when you are getting down onto eye level, for someone watching this might want to come to the park and get those more unique shots. Any tips for them? Yeah, so here at Brooks Lodge, we actually have uh, two full-time guides on staff. Uh, it's primarily fishing, but it's definitely like we're here to help you get what you want out of the experience. So um, rates are the same as fishing as bear viewing, but we definitely do bear viewing as well. Um, and as long as I'm here, uh, there'll be at least somebody who understands camera gear. So ISO, shutter speed, how you want your settings. Um, I shoot Sony, so I know that primarily, but I have kind of versed myself in all of the gear, so I know how to help people use it. Nice. And then our primary goal is to keep people safe while doing the activities they want to do on the river. Uh, and this year they've implemented a permit system. You can technically walk the river if you're just staying in the campground without a guide. Uh, however, if you don't want to deal with the permit process or you're a little unsure about safety measures, you can definitely have one of us uh, take you out and keep you safe. That sounds great. Yep. And then how do you feel about being on shore versus getting into the water as far as like the photo quality and also like your, the safety and the comfort for the animals, kind of the ethics of it? Yeah, so um, the NPS here at Brooks does a really cool thing. Uh, they call it bear orientation where every single visitor to this park, is, it's mandatory to go through a 10 to 15 minute video course about bear safety, which really keeps this place super safe for bears and visitors alike. There's never really been an incident with bear and human in this park, specifically Brooks Camp, which the amount of bears here and the amount of traffic that we get is really says something about the success of that program. So that's super helpful uh, safety wise. Uh, as far as photography goes, there are spots you can get um, along the river without getting into the water that are cool. Um, but as far as like super unique stuff, every person that I've taken out on the river has been like thrilled with how unique the experience is of being in the, well, the water with the bears. You just kind of feel way more connected with them. Yeah, I'll definitely vouch for that. I was able to spend a couple of days walking the river. Some things that I realized like the, the whole time you're here, you're in bear country. So you'll have to be aware the entire time. And especially like when you dip off that trail and go down the yep. Fisher Trail. Yep. It feels, I mean, there's really no difference. It's a trail with no railings anywhere, but it feels so much scarier. And then I thought once I got through that, through the grass into the water, you can see, see 50 yards in every direction and you know if something's coming up on you. So I think if you guys are interested in coming, getting those more unique shots, go out with one of the guides. They have waiters here and it's a, life-changing experience for sure. Yeah, those first few steps through that little, like we call it the angler trail, mm -hmm. right, because law enforcement marks it and that's the route they want us to take. That is a little bit where you're like, oh, where's this person taking me? You know, like, cool, there's bears everywhere. What am I gotten myself into? But the second, like you said, you get through this little tall grass section, you get into the river. I prefer to be in the river uh, just because I at least know what's coming. So I can, I have, like you said, sight lines for hundreds of yards. Uh, there's certain sections where you don't have that, um, that feel a little sketchier. I've had a couple of you know, encounters where you're like, I wish I had more sight lines, and that's never happened in the river. It's always kind of been getting to the river or trying to get, you know, find my spot and pick and choose where to go. Yep. Have you been properly nervous? Like more scared than just like, okay, I can acknowledge the situation. Definitely, I think, um, the one thing that Brooks Camp can kind of lull you into is these bears are so used to human activity and you see them so often in camp that some people have a tendency to forget that these are wild animals. Uh, they're coastal brown bears, they're properly wild. Habituation exists and they're definitely used to people, but you still have to treat it as if it's, it's clearly something that could kill you if something goes wrong and you know get, gets a little out of hand. Um, so there's been a few times I've been nervous uh, definitely. But at the same time, if, if you come out with one of us or, you know, I've read a lot about bear behavior knowing I was going to move here. They do, they have a lot of signs of stress. So mm. yawning, jaw popping, huffing. If you see any of that stuff, even if you're outside of 50 yards, I like to keep my distance mm -hmm. beyond that. You know, there's that 50 yard threshold that the National Park Service puts in place here. If I see signs of nervousness, nervousness beyond 50, I'll still give them extra space. Yeah. And there's, there's certain times where 50 yards is impossible to do. 
just kind of where you're at. If a bear's coming at you, you have no place to go behind you. At that point, you kind of stand your ground. But 50 yards is the benchmark that we try to keep at all times. And beyond that, signs of stress, I just try to make sure that the animal doesn't show any signs of stress wherever I am. Have you gotten used to it? Meaning, like, I've been here twice. I've been here for four days, seen more bears than I can count in those four days. But I still haven't seen one. I'm sure there's some around here and not been like, oh man, that's super cool. Have you gotten used to it or is it worn off a little bit? Uh, no, I've, so the other half of my job is every uh, day we get passengers in on float planes. So that's one of the two main modes of transportation in here. It's how we get all of our groceries delivered, all of our propane to heat the buildings, run the kitchen. And I've definitely had times where I'm like, man, we got a plane coming in, there's a bear than 50, it's gonna cause me a hassle. Uh -huh. where I'm like, I find myself for a moment being like annoyed at a bear. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm like, come on, man, you were in their space, you know? But as far as seeing bears go and the excitement of seeing bears, bears are my favorite animal. Um, I'll never get sick of them. I There's times I wake up in the morning and I just like laugh that I live here. Yeah. So I try really hard to stay on like the, I'm so blessed to be here. Uh, I see my favorite animal every single day. I've talked to some of the rangers who have been here for 10 plus years and they're still excited yep. about it. Yep, it's an awesome place. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about how the gear shows up here and the cooking and everything. You wanna give us a little behind the scenes on like how this whole place functions, how it keeps rolling? This is all National Park Service property. So the lodge itself is a concessionaire within the National Park Service. So the National Park Service owns all of our buildings. So we have a user agreement through the National Park to be like a functioning lodge in their area. As far as all of the heating in the lodge and NPS staff, there is a barge, it's all heated by diesel. And so there's a barge and a 3000 gallon diesel tanker that runs 10 to 12 ish trips to based on the weather to get heating for all of this place. As far as the lodge goes, we serve uh, buffet style meals three times a day. So we go through a lot of food, a lot of groceries, a lot of supplies. It is really good food too. Like shockingly delicious food. The chef's awesome. For the amount of people we serve, it's really, really good. And so we get, Wednesdays we get all of our freight in. We get food, supplies. So we get an aircraft type called an Otter. It can hold up to 2,200 pounds. And so we get one or two of those per week. So between 2,000 and 4,000 pounds of goods per week. Um, so those fly in on float planes and we kind of put those on a tractor, drive it up to kitchen and all that stuff and kind of store it. Thinking more about giving people who are looking to come here some advice. Mm -hmm. So I know you can come just for a day trip. Yep. You can come and stay in the lodge mm -hmm. and you can come and stay in the campground. Yep. Did I miss anything? Ways of getting- Nope, those are the options. Okay. So you can, so getting here for day trips, you can take a water taxi from King Salmon. Uh, you can take a float plane from King Salmon or Anchorage, depending on how it goes. Uh, a lot of different uh, uh, operations fly here. But my biggest piece of advice is float planes fly with visual flight. So they don't have instruments. It's not like a Delta or Southwest. So don't plan your trip and have like, oh, I have an hour and a half layover. I can make that. Because if there's any sort of delay on our end, it's gonna cause you a lot of headaches. And this summer we've had a lot of rain and fog and I've had a lot of like, our one o'clock flight gets out at five or whatever. So there's been a lot of like visual flight delays. And so don't bunch those connections up like crazy. Give yourself a night on either side. Like if this is a trip you're planning for years and years, don't crunch the time. Give yourself space on either end of the days you're here in case something happens, you can still get here. How long do people that stay can you tell like an average duration? It depends. So in July, the lodge guests are limited to three nights just because it's our busiest month. Um, I don't know exactly how the campground permit system works. It's just through recreation.gov for that. Uh, there's, it's a, like a lottery system. They open like half of them on a certain date and a half on a later date. Yeah, we got in on that. Super yeah. excited. So campground stay um, I've had them stay long, like the average duration is a little longer than the lodge typically. Granted, we're just kind of halfway through August, so we're kind of into our season where if someone checked in today staying five nights, so the three night cap is out on that section, but tons of people come for the day. Uh, a lot of people come for one night, but I would suggest at least doing three days, uh, just two full days with bears if you want, and then we run a tour up the 10,000, or Valley of 10,000 Smokes, which is really, really cool. Um, it gives an opportunity to see other wildlife. There's lynx and wolves up there. 
and there's a 1912 volcanic eruption that kind of just layered a ton of ash up there. And so it's just a totally different section of the park that we take you up to. So I would highly suggest doing that if you come up. Cool, that sounds fun. If anyone watching from the Facebook group, hello. And if anyone watching not a part of that Facebook group, the best bear nerds on the internet have congregated in one place on Facebook. So if you ever have a question about what the bears are doing, what time of year, you can ask questions about tips for the campsite or any of that, the Facebook group's amazing. So for them, we do have a few questions that I wanted to make sure we addressed. One really interesting one question is something I've been pondering is what makes a wildlife photographer ethical versus unethical in general and at Brooks Katmai in particular. So in general, I think there's a lot of wildlife photographers out there who put who value the shot over the actual animal. Um, so they'll do anything to cut corners, get close as possible, even sometimes baiting wildlife to come towards you, food rewards in order to get that face on shot, whatever they're thinking of. You know, whatever dream shot they have, they'll stop at no ends to get that. So that's what I would call wildly unethical. Um, there's also pushing the limits of ethics, especially here um, at Brooks Camp, about distance to bears. So the NPS enforces, and I fully like support the 50 yard rule. Bears are quick animals. They seem like, you know, they're kind of, they get so fat here that you're like, oh man, but I can see that, I see that how fast they move. 50 yards is a good barometer, and if you have good gear, 50 yards is plenty close. Yep. And I think specifically here, the 50 yards is not like, I'm not doing anything wrong even if I'm beyond 50 yards. I think a good thing to notice is um, just keeping up on that bear behavior, specifically stress signs, yawning, jaw popping, huffing. If you see any of those signs and you're a photographer and you consider yourself ethical, I would consider it ethical to kind of give that bear space even if you're about to get a really good shot if it's showing stress signs. And a lot of things, if I know a bear is showing stress signs, I don't necessarily want that photograph anyways. My main priority in uh, being a wildlife photographer is photographing animals and their natural behavior. If they're stressed, you're not gonna witness that natural behavior. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna benefit yourself more in the long term if you do things ethically, give them space, make sure they're relaxed and behaving normally, you'll see way cooler interactions. Cool, I like it. So here's a question. If we're coming to Brooks next year in June, when is the best time to set up a guide before or after we arrive? I think they're I think they're asking more of like the technical process. Should they do it like online or once they get here see what's available? Yeah, I'd call I'd call before you get here. Okay. We don't typically fill the guidebook super super far in advance. Um, and there's always a chance you could book us once you get here. But if that's something that you're truly set on, I would go ahead and call Catmyland, catmyland.com. I'm not sure the number off the top. It'll be here. I would go ahead and call that number before you get here. Yeah, set it up before. I like it. Do you as a guide, did you have to go any through any specific bear training before working at Brooks? So we went through the typical bear school that everyone does. We did that as a staff as soon as we got here. But me and Evan, the other guide currently, we have to go through specific guide training with uh, the law enforcement of the park. Specific things to look out on the river, specific paths to take, routes to take. And then we walk the river early season just to know every in and out that's safe, where if a bear comes from this spot and I'm here, I know where to go. So I spent three weeks just walking this river back and forth, learning where to go and when to go in case something would ever happen. And especially early season, the water level was way lower than it is now. And so you kind of learn the channels and the deep spots before the season starts. Oh, that's smart. And then whenever you have a client, you know where to go. And then you know that client's capabilities on depth and water speed. And yep. so you have to keep all that in mind and you know all of your possible outs. We learned my capabilities for depth and water speed earlier. I think I did okay, but it's, it's different. Walking in the water is definitely tricky. It's an experience to get used to, for sure. <laughs> Best suggestions for enjoying a guided photography session in the river or what mistakes has he seen people make? Have you seen people make? Yeah, just kind of know your settings. So I've had a lot of people like, we get out there and they are just kind of clueless how their gear works. So before we get out there, just make sure you know how your gear works, make sure you understand shutter speed, aperture, things like that, just kind of the basics. I can help you with some of those, but other guides may not be able to. Yep. And then another thing that I would suggest 
is it's super important to listen to your guide. You can get lost in that viewfinder a lot. You know, you see a really cool scene and you're just kind of, you get sucked into that viewfinder. And things are different than what you see in that viewfinder sometimes. Uh huh. So like I've had, I had a guy like, I'm like, hey, let's go, let's go. Time to move, time to move. But he's getting those shots of that bear walking at him and he puts his camera down out of his viewfinder and he was like, oh, you know, cause even if you're at 70 to 200 or something, you can kind of get lost in that viewfinder. So selfishly, I would say listening to your guide is the most important thing. And then just understanding the basics of your gear. Yep, makes sense. And I think from my perspective, I was happy to come here and spend a full day uh, just photographing from the platforms. And then you can use that time to make sure you know how your gear works. You can make sure your focus system is the way you want it. And then you'll be able to get the best shots possible once you're out there. That's an awesome suggestion. So if you're here for multiple days, day one, dial in all of your stuff at the platform. If it's a time of year where the falls platform has a weight, sometimes they implement a weight system. If it's a super busy, I love the riffles platform. You can hang out there while you wait for the falls platform. Um, I think it's a unique spot anyways. I kind of prefer to hang out there. Just spend a day dialing in all your stuff there, especially if you have a guide trip on the books. That way we can maximize it as much as possible. I would say, if, especially if you have a longer lens, something about 600 or maybe a little longer, the shots from riffles are super cool because you get that like straight on to the falls perspective. What do you and maybe some of the other staffers, what do a lot of people do in the off season? That's a great question. I have no idea yet. So I quit a d almost decade long job to come up here just because this place is so special. And hopefully I'll do some other sort of guiding, whether it's fishing or photography. But even if it's just something seasonal in a cool spot, I'll figure it out. And then my plan is definitely to return next year here. That's good to hear. So you haven't gotten like sick of it? No, every day is awesome here. That's... Yep. Yep. I'm taking it for granted for sure. That's I'm not great. taking it for granted. Like right now there's a bear 30 yards from us. Yeah. See, I'm like looking through Facebook questions and there's that right there. This is more of a kind of technical question on the uh, guided tour side. She would like to know if you are able to adjust the route of the river walk based on a person's comfort level. For someone who isn't comfortable getting in the deep water, is it possible to stay along the edge? Definitely, we can adjust everything we do. Uh, that's probably the one of the main points of guiding is to keep everybody safe. So the first thing I do is ask health questions and then kind of gauge people's ability. And then we'll do a little test in this first section of river just so I can kind of see how you do. You saw it today, we have yeah. a little, we had a little training wheels river crossing. Yeah, um, for the bigger one. So I like to do that. So if, if people are a little bit hesitant there's definitely ways that we can customize each trip to make it the best of what they want very good and what is your most memorable moment as a river guide oh uh -huh. there was um a spot just below riffles i was on the the river with one uh, gentleman doing photography and uh, there was three sub adults snorkeling you know chasing a school of salmon downstream and there was one on a little cut island and we were kind of backed into this little corner where we didn't really have a place to go. So it's one of those situations where you kind of just hang out, you know? Uh, we were able to get out of the river, but we didn't really have a, an escape backwards. It was fine, it was safe. The salmon kind of, like there's a main channel that switches the sides of the river. So they like to chase them all right there. So I kind of like to set up and you get like that base on salmon dive in the water, catching, trying to catch a salmon shot. So we were hanging out there for a bit and three sub adults come down at once and kind of school the salmon and they kind of all like looped right in front of us and the one downstream started chasing and so we actually got out of the river onto the bank and it like dove to try to catch a salmon and it like splashed us with water while wow. it was trying to catch salmon so like where that marked angler trail ends yep we went downstream and crossed yep so like where that point of that island is where it kind of starts swinging back yeah right. yep yeah i was able to be there yesterday it is amazing yep. I think we should get to wrapping things up. I do, I think my last question would be, after your time being here, do you, pref do you get more excited about the perfect photograph or the best fish? Oh man. So I would have answered perfect photograph 10 times out of 10 before I came here. And then I have not touched my camera in a week and a half. I caught a 28 inch, 28 inch rainbow like four days ago. Wow. So uh, I've been chasing fish like crazy. 
I'm sure it's gonna loop back once the, like we've also had like a super rainy and gray summer. So the light has been pretty dull. I'm sure it's gonna loop back to photography cause that's my first love, but I'd say it's 50-50 tie right now. Well, you're in the 50-50 perfect spot to do it's that. It's the best spot for my two hobbies yeah. and my two enjoy, like things I enjoy the most. Well, John, thank you so much for our experience today. We had a ton of fun going out on the river with you and for taking the time to chat with us. Perfect. Any final words? Advice to people watching this, anyone searching out this video, you probably have Brooks on a bucket list and Katmai on a bucket list to get to. I had it on my bucket list and it succeeded expectations for the whole summer. So if you feel like coming here, definitely try to make it happen. Give yourself more than a day and spend some time out here. So that was it. Thank you, John, so much again for taking the time to sit down and have that chat with us. And if you've enjoyed watching this video, please give it the thumbs up. And if you're interested in seeing those other videos I mentioned before about our trip up to Alaska, please hit that subscribe button and they'll be coming out soon. Again, my name is Alex McGregor. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you on the next video.